Okay, good morning. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? Let's go ahead and open our Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians. That was just for Facebook Live. So, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 17 is what we're looking at here today. Um, I just It's amazing to me that we're already through the second chapter and moving into the third chapter. Uh, next week we'll do kind of a topical, and then I think I'm going to try to sneak a... Uh, Bible prophecy update in there because all the things that are going on. But, um, you know, Paul's kind of, as he's been dealing with this first uh, two chapters here, it's been a very heavy kind of thing where he's trying to justify himself about some things that have happened. And there's a lot of sorrow and a lot of talk of affliction, a lot of talk of uh, things that have happened and persecution and a real kind of heaviness as uh, Paul begins the first two chapters here. But um, as he moves away from that and gets into really where we are in the second chapter, all the way through chapter to chapter seven, it really is a more uplifting view of the Christian church and the ministry and our ministering to each other. And, and Paul begins with this very high note here today where he just says, man, we are champions. We are, uh, you know, always being led by the Lord into victory. And, uh, and that kind of continues on until, like I said, chapter 7. And so it's, a, it's an interesting switch that Paul does here after dealing with this heaviness. Now he's going to move on. And so uh, I've entitled the message today, The Smell of Victory. The Smell of Victory, and you'll see why here in a minute. But let's go ahead and read that, uh, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas <clears throat> to, speak, uh, to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death, leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? We are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word here today, Lord. We thank you for another opportunity to come and study it together and uh, just learn from it. But, Father, also the, the chance to abide in your word as you abide in us. And so we welcome you here today, Lord, to just do the work that needs to be done in each heart in this room. Convict us where we need it, Lord. Encourage us where we need it. And help us to see the victory that you have brought for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, two key words to look at here today. Doors and odors. Or odors. <laughs> Uh, that's the, what I'm going with. Um, because you see that the first two verses are still kind of in that um, things are happening. You know, uh, I'm still trying to explain to the church in Corinth why I wasn't able to come down there. Uh, you know, I went up there to Troas to see Titus and I was really hoping that I would see him because he was supposed to be coming from Corinth to come up there and meet me and tell me what was going on in your church. But then he wasn't there and so I got bummed out and then I just went on to Macedonia and uh, went on my missionary journey from there. And then again, he comes back in, the, in that 14th verse though and, and really begins with that God leads us in triumph. Uh, in Christ. And so um, there's, there's doors that we walk through in the, in the Christian faith for sure. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're just somebody attending the church, or just in your own walk with the Lord, God opens doors for us. He opens doors and he closes doors. And this is very, very important for us to understand in the church today, uh, the, the opening and closing of doors. But I want to kind of concentrate on this uh, fragrance of Christ idea. It really goes back very, you know, far into the distant past. 
this, uh, it's kind of like this ticker tape parade that we're familiar with here in the United States. When we have a war or some kind of great achievement in the United States, you know, we like to honor our heroes. And we like to bring them through New York City or our hometown or wherever and uh, have a parade and, and really cheer them on as they go down the street. And I'm sure you've seen these kind of things before. World War II is, of course, a big one as uh, people were coming home from the war after, you know, really a five-year war, drawn out kind of a thing. Uh, but we had a great victory and uh, won the peace around the world. And these ticker tape parades were kind of a, an example of those kind of things. And, and I'm sure you've seen pictures of these things. But it's really what Paul is kind of trying to get at when he's talking about this uh, Christ leading us in triumph. He's talking about their ticker tape parades that Rome had back in their day. And that's what he's referring to there. And uh, you can see that. In this painting here, it's called a Roman triumph where uh, a general or like the commander in chief would go out and have a great victory and he would be led through the city of Rome, a very special route that would ultimately end up at the Colosseum and uh, in tow were his generals and, and all of his army, this conquering army, but also all the, the loot that they had taken as a result of conquering and also the conquered soldiers that were being brought along with them. And uh, as they would make their way through town, of course, the cheering and all the things that were going on, but also what was happening is the Roman priests were burning incense. And that incense became this, uh, this whole idea of a victory. And so, but to the Romans who are cheering this on, man, that incense smells great, doesn't it? The smell of victory. But to those soldiers in the back of the procession who, are, who know that they're on their way to their deaths in the Colosseum, that's not a good smell. That's a smell of death leading us to death. And, uh, and so that's what Paul is talking about here. And so we'll get more into that as we go. But uh, I, I wanted to start with that just to give you an idea. The conquering commanders uh, winning a decisive victory Killing at least 5,000 enemy soldiers and gaining new territory for the emperor were entitled to a Roman triumph. The processional honored them with a royal ride in a golden chariot through the streets of Rome, with a long line of the spoils of battle and captive enemy soldiers in tow, heading for their deaths in the Colosseum. And uh, this is another picture of that. Unfortunately, this is a, a view of the Jews who were conquered in 70 AD as uh, Titus came in and, and just destroyed the, the Jewish population there and uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, disbanded all of the Jews from there and uh, really spread them out all over the Roman world. Uh, and, and so you see the spoils of that battle being marched in that Roman triumph up to Rome. And that's what this is de depicting here. But uh, the Roman priests would also be in the parade, carrying burning, uh, carrying burning incense to pay tribute to the victorious army. As the Roman priests burned the incense in the parade, that odor affected different people in different ways. To the triumphant soldiers, it meant life and victory. But to the conquered enemy, it meant defeat and death. They were on their way to be killed by the beasts, by the lions, you know, by the wild beasts that they would bring in to the Colosseum. Uh, these, these conquered soldiers would come in and have to fight those beasts and, and, and eventually die from it. And so that smell, again, of that incense, it meant something very, very different to uh, the people that were there. Uh, to the one, it meant life. It meant victory. It meant conquering. And to the other, of course, it meant death. And so uh, using this image of the incense, Paul pictured the Christian ministry. He saw believers as incense, giving forth the fragrance of Jesus Christ in their lives and labors. To God, believers are the very fragrance of Jesus Christ. To other believers, we are the fragrance of life. But to unbelievers, we are the fragrance of death. In other words, the Christian life and ministry are matters of life and death. And that's why Paul says, who is sufficient for that? 
I mean, this is heavy, heavy stuff that we're dealing with here. We're dealing with matters of life and death, not just in this life, but matters of life and death eternally. And so you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are giving off this fragrance of Christ as we walk. And we wonder why, you know, people hate us and want to persecute us sometimes. But it is because they are perishing. They have not given their lives to Christ. And they are on their road to death and eternal death. They have no dealings with the, the Christian understanding at all. And it just stinks to them. It doesn't smell good at all. And so if you wonder that why sometimes people just automatically reject you for being a Christian. Oh, you're a Christian? Ugh. I don't want to talk to you. Now, we, of course, have given uh, Christianity a, a bad name and a black eye. And there's other reasons that people don't want to talk to us. But deep down in their hearts, uh, people who reject God, reject God because they don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to be told how to live their life. They don't want to be told they're living unrighteously and that they should live differently and they, that they should humble themselves and confess their sins to God and then live a different kind of life. They don't want to deal with that. And so they reject that out, outright. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a great understanding for us here today. And so we begin here with these doors, first of all, though. Uh, furthermore, when I came to Troas, Paul says, to preach Christ's gospel, when I finally arrived at that place, I felt that there was a door opened, he says. There was this door of opportunity for the gospel to go out and be preached. Uh, at certain times, and we'll look at it here in a minute, you know, Paul was prevented from teaching the gospel. He wasn't allowed to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit wouldn't let him do it. Or Satan hindered him from doing different things. And we're going to look at quite a few verses that deal with that here today. But he said, when I came to Troas, first of all, he was going to meet uh, Titus there in Troas. They had set it up beforehand that Titus had been down in Corinth uh, trying to find out if the believers down there had received the letters that Paul had written to them. The letters of rebuke and the letters of, hey, you need to stop the sin. You need to, uh, you know, put that person out of the church if they're not going to confess their sin. And, and all the stuff that we've been talking about for the last couple weeks. But uh, Titus was to get that information, find out what was going on, and then go back up and meet Paul across the Aegean Sea back over in Troas. And we're going to show you a map here in a minute so you can get all that picture. Uh, and then tell Paul... Okay, yeah, things are going good. They've received it. They've repented of their sins. And now we can go see them again, or you can go see them again, and not have to come down on them hard again because they haven't repented. But Titus isn't there. Titus isn't in Troas when Paul shows up. But he's preaching that gospel, and he notices right away that people are receiving it. And so he says, a door was opened to me by the Lord. The door of the gospel being allowed to be preached, not only allowed to be preached, but people are hearing it and they're accepting it and they're repenting of their, their sins and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, man, this incredible door of opportunity to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ has been opened to me here, but I'm so bummed about you people down in Corinth that I didn't stick around. I was, yes, being used by the Lord, and, and I saw this incredible door opened for the gospel. It had been opened by the Lord, and he's allowing the gospel to go forth. But I was so bummed when I couldn't find Titus there, and I couldn't find out what had happened to you guys, that I just departed from there and went over to Macedonia and left that place. And it really is a picture of some of the brokenness that we find in the ministry some of the, uh, the depression that comes along from ministers as they try to be used by the Lord and other things are happening in the church and, and things are getting mixed up. Uh, but it is, again, this door has been opened. And I do want to talk about that because it's important that we understand these doors because that's how God works in, in my life as a pastor, as I'm trying to see how this church should be operating and what we should be doing from here and going over there and doing this stuff and what building we should rent and all those kind of things. I really believe that God opens doors and closes doors. 
And so we need to knock on those doors. Lord, is this door open? Let's, let's try to push on that door a little bit. If it, if it won't open, then okay, God's not opening that opportunity. Let's move on and see if we can find another opportunity. In a lot of ways, we're like blind people. <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of hitting the curb and doing the thing with our cane and pushing on things and just trying to find out because these are spiritual doors and our eyes cannot see into that spiritual darkness. Uh, but the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, wants to lead and guide us into an understanding of what he wants us to do, what his will is for our lives. And it's the same for you in your life. It, it, you know, you, you pray, well, Lord, what's your will for my life? What is your will for my life? Well, don't just ask. You know, uh, there's that old say, saying about, you know, the old cars that didn't have power steering back in the 50s and 60s, you know. It's really hard to push those things and steer them until they get going. Once they get going, then the steering wheel is easy to, to turn, and you can go in different directions. But before you get going, you can't steer that thing. And it's a, it's a lot of the same way, I think. You, we step out in faith and say, all right, Lord, I believe you're, you're directing me in this direction. There's an open door in this direction, so I'm going to start walking in that direction. And then as I'm walking in faith, the Holy Spirit is able to say, no, don't go over there. Oh, okay, go back over this way. You know, he does that for us. But if we're just like, oh, I'm just waiting on the Lord to tell me what to do. Forget about it. <laughs> he ain't going to do it. Because you're not acting in faith. You're just saying, I want to see with my eyes what God wants me to do. And I'm not willing to take a step of faith. And uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Been there too. That doesn't work too well. And I think a lot of Christians, they spend the majority of their lives not doing anything for the Lord because they're waiting for some lightning bolt to come down and, you know, do this or see a, a, like the old farmer, he saw a P up in the sky, the letter P in the clouds. And he said, well, that's the Lord telling me to preach. And so he became a, preach, a preacher. And, uh, but he was a terrible preacher. He was an awful preacher. He couldn't preach at all. And so one time somebody came up to him and said, hey, why are you a preacher? You don't seem like you have a gift to do this, really. And he said, well, you know, one day I was out in the, farm, out in the field, I was a farmer, and I looked up in the sky and saw a pea in the clouds. And the guy said, maybe the Lord was telling you to plant corn. So, you know, there's those possibilities. But, you know, God is able to, to guide. That was kind of funny. Come on. All right. Then we got a good, better laugh on the front row there. Okay, let's move on. Um, Paul says in to the first Corinthian in the first Corinthian letter there, he said in chapter 16, verse 8 through 9, I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. Why, Paul? For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. <laughs> I know the Lord is working here in Ephesus, so I'm going to hang out here in Ephesus because God's opened this incredible door of opportunity. The word of God is going out. People are getting saved. There are people opposing us. So what does that mean? That we're going in the right direction. There are many adversaries trying to shut us up and stop us from preaching the gospel and getting people saved. Therefore, we're doing a good work here. God's opened a great door here. And so I'm going to stay here and ride this wave until I feel like the Lord's leading me to go on from there. And, and so Paul so many times he was led in this very same way where he felt like the Lord was, was directing him in a certain way. He would walk in that direction until he felt like the Lord changed that direction. And we can find so many verses that tell us those kind of things. Um, Colossians 4.2 says, uh, continually, uh, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word and speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Pray for me that God opens a door that I can go out and preach the way I know I'm supposed to preach and just get this message out to the world, to the lost world that's around me. Open a door, Lord, open a door. And I encourage you to pray that. Mm -hmm. I, pray, I encourage you to pray, God, open a door for this church to be effective out in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and in other places in the world that you draw us to, that you lead us to. 
F.B. Meyer says, remember, it is God who opens great and effectual doors before his servants. It is of no use to force them, <laughs> right? Some of us, I think we have chainsaws and we go, okay, there's a closed door. I don't want to take care of that. And we chop that door down. I'm coming through that door whether you want me to or not, Lord. Right? Have you ever done that? That's just me. Okay. Um, I'm coming through that door. I want to go through that door. That's where I want to be. And so I'm going to push that door open. I'm going to force that door open. And then what do we find? Oh, the Lord's not in it. I wonder what happened. You know, and uh, so... There's no use of us trying to force doors open. Just gently push a little bit. Just gently push a bit. And uh, I, I find that the Lord opens and closes those doors very easily for us if we're faithful just to follow him and be led by him. Let us wait for the Lord who has the key of David to open them for then none can shut. Our duty is to be prepared to enter when the moment comes and the door swings wide, right? You know, um, I think e even in our church here, especially in our church, I think, you know, we've uh, waited for quite a while for the Lord to be growing the church and, and to direct us into the things he wants us to do. And, um, you know, it, we're still kind of in that waiting mode, but are we prepared? Sometimes you have to ask the question, are we prepared to grow or are we prepared to go and do a great work for the Lord? Uh, or is he waiting for us to do the work of preparation? Or is there something else that we're missing? Maybe we're not ready to walk through a door of opportunity yet and allow the Lord to use us in a mighty way. I know a lot of us here are very excited about what the Lord's doing here right now, and, and we feel like the Lord is directing us. And, and I think, you know, it's uh, an interesting time for us. But uh, again, our duty is to be prepared to enter that door, to walk through that door and be used by the Lord once he opens that door. And so that's the key for us here today. <clears throat> Romans 1.13 says, I often plan to come to you. Now he's talking to another church. And you see in these, these verses, he's dealing with a bunch of different churches. In the same way he's talking to Corinth and saying, hey, I really wish I could come down there and see you guys, but da da da, da I had things that, that prevented me from doing that. And now he's talking to the church in Rome and saying the same kind of thing. I often plan to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also. I was hindered from coming to you. There were things that were happening. There were doors that were closed and didn't allow me to come to you. Here we see uh, Paul again telling the Thessalonican church in chapter 2, verse 18, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. We weren't able to come. There was a closed door there. Uh, Satan was not allowing us to do what we felt we should be doing. And you could take that as a, a door that the Lord has closed as well, if the Lord doesn't uh, force that door open for you. Uh, probably the biggest one, though, that we see here, and this is what I want to kind of camp on for a minute, is in Acts chapter 16. We see this uh, long, drawn-out paragraph of things that happened to Paul. As Paul is making his way up into Asia Minor on his first missionary journey, and he's just trying to figure out where the Lord wants him to go on his, ex, his second missionary journey. He, as he's making his way up there, we see several occasions where, no, we can't go over there. No, we can't go over there. And then they end up all the way over at the water's edge in Troas. And then they get this incredible message from the Lord via a vision. And so let me play that out for you here in these verses. Uh, it says, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, I'm going to show you a map here in a minute. As he's going up there, Asia is kind of down to his left, and Bithynia is up to his right. And so he's trying to go up and uh, maybe go over into Asia, and the, the Holy Spirit says, no, I don't want you going over there right now. And so prevents them. We don't know how. Paul doesn't go into detail about it. He just feels, some, maybe in his spirit, he just feels, no, the Lord has said, don't go over there right now. We were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia on the left. Then they tried to go to Bithynia. Okay, God doesn't want us to go to the left. Maybe let's go up here to the right to Bithynia. But the Spirit did not permit them. <laughs> okay, Lord, what are you trying to do here? <laughs> can't go left, can't go right. What do you want us to do? And so here's that map uh, real quick. 
Uh, you see there, again, as he's making his way through Derby and Iconium, Lystra, Antioch of Pisidia, he's coming over, and he's kind of on the trajectory to go over to these churches that we know well in the book of Revelation, right? Pergamum, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Sardis, Smyrna, all those places where he planted churches. Uh, he's kind of headed in that way, and the Lord says, nope, and points him back north. And then Bithynia is up there on the top in that light green, and that's where Galatia is in the church of Galatia. And, uh, and so he's going up that way, and then the Holy Spirit says, no, nope, don't go up there either. And so he's got this Marmara Sea over here to the left. He can't go any further that way. And so he's just on this trajectory that takes him right over here to this town of Troas. I should have done that earlier. Isn't that a neat graphic? But uh, <laughs> so he ends up in this town of Troas on the ocean. And it really reminds me of the children of Israel when they're coming out in the Exodus, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're running for their lives to get away from the pursuing Egyptian army. Two, two million of them. And they don't know where, but they're heading in this direction. And then they get to a place where they can't go anymore. They come to an outcropping of land. Uh, the ocean's in front of them. There's cliffs on one side, cliffs on the other side. The Egyptian army is behind them. It's like, Lord, what have you done to us, you know? You let us out here to slaughter us at this water's edge. And what does the Lord do? <sighs> Opens up the sea. They walk through on dry land. The sea closes behind and kills the Egyptian army. I mean, it's an incredible story. Lord, where do you want me to go? How do you want me? No, you don't want me to go over there. Okay, you don't want me to go up that way. Okay, I'm going to go over this way until you tell me to stop then. And then he gets to the water's edge. What happens at the water's edge? Acts 16, 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man from Macedonia or a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, come over here to Macedonia and help us. Now, let me back up for just a minute here. So you see where that Macedonia is. Macedonia is on the other side of the water. Paul's there at the water's edge. He can't go any further. He can't go left. He can't go right. What do you want me to do, Lord? He goes to sleep that night, a vision of a man saying, come over here and help us. And so all he has to do is cross the ocean now <laughs> or cross this channel of water anyway. So you see Macedonia over there in the top left. And uh, they go over there, and man, the Lord lights everything on fire. A great door of opportunity. People get saved. Churches get planted. And we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. I mean, it's incredible what the Lord did through that situation. Man from Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. He's not calling us to Asia right now. He's not calling us to Bithynia right now. He's given us a vision to go over there and preach the gospel to them. And so what are we going to do? We're going to do it. We're going to walk through that door that has been opened to us from the Lord. It's, it's an incredible thing. I... Um, I preached uh, or taught through the book of Acts early on in my ministry. I, when I took over my first church, I taught the book of Mark, and then I taught the book of Acts. And I came to this place, it was just, I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen that before. It was just mind-blowing to me that the Lord is going to move you and, and, and tell you to go this way and prevent you from going that way. And, and it's just so foundational for us as believers and I just encourage you, allow the Lord to lead you that way. You don't have to see it with your eyes. You don't have to know for sure. Gerilyn and I, when we were considering getting out of the military, retiring from the military and going into the ministry and all that stuff, uh, it was so cloudy, you know. It was like I had this calling from the Lord, but I kept saying, Lord, Show me how you're going to do this. Show me how you're going to do this. Show me how you're going to get me into the ministry. I don't want to retire from the Navy until I know the whole plan. Give me the 10-year plan, Lord. Just give me 10 years ahead of me so I know what's going to happen as soon as, like, the day after I get out of the military and then the, the week after that, you know, you show me, <laughs> you know. He doesn't work that way. He says, hey, 
take a step of faith. I'll guide you. I'll lead you. I'll point you in the right direction. And it's so rewarding when you allow the Lord to do that, when you trust him to do that, and then he brings you to a place of, you know, almost desperation. And then you're just crying out, Lord, what are you doing to me here? And then he says, boom, opens that water. He opens that door and allows you to walk through it. And then you can just do nothing but give him glory for it. Amen? Amen. Woo! Amen! <laughs> That'll preach, won't it? Okay, now let's look at uh, this other part of it. Paul says, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. Even though there was a door of opportunity, I was so freaked out about what was going on down there in Corinth and I needed to know what was happening down there so badly that I couldn't minister in this place that God had opened a door. And, and Paul just freely admits that. I was so freaked out about you guys. I just couldn't even, even though people were coming to the Lord and this door was open, I, I was still just, you know, Titus wasn't there and I had no rest in my spirit. I, I just couldn't deal with it. And so I left. I went to uh, taking my leave of them in Troas, I departed for Macedonia. But then look what happens as Paul just completely changes his whole demeanor and everything that he's talking about and just starts praising the Lord. One last thing about the doors here. Uh, John Trapp, uh, old, old preacher. When we see a door opened, we can have faith that God will bless the ministry. When the master sets up a light, there is some work to be done. When he sends forth his laborers, guess what? There's a harvest to be reaped. And so again, are we ready? Are we ready? When we see the Lord start doing things, when we see a light, when we see a door open, when we see these things happening, we have to get ready and be ready in our hearts because we know the Lord's about to do something. And it's a great way to understand the ministry of the Lord in that way. And so uh, these odors that we're going to talk about now, this fragrance of Christ that we are in the world, in the lost world. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Ultimately, he's saying, ultimately, yeah, chapter one and chapter two were not a whole lot of fun. There was a lot of sorrow. There was a lot of anguish. There was a lot of affliction going on. There were a lot of bummed out people about things I said to them. And there was a lot of turmoil in the churches. But ultimately, we are in a victorious organization in the church, in the body of Christ. It's very easy to pick on the church, isn't it? And, uh, and I think it's okay to, to look and see that there are pockets in the church that are becoming apostate and, and even worse, you know, large pockets of the church becoming apostate. But when the church is really working, when the church is doing its job, be careful about picking on the church. Be careful about bad mouth in the church of Christ. Because at some point, somewhere, the Holy Spirit's at work and he's doing the work that needs to be done and the people there are being faithful to do that work and we don't want to trash talk that at all. We want to be very careful about that because ultimately Christ is leading his church. He's leading the body and he's doing the things that his father wants him to do through the body of Christ. And so be careful about bad-mouthing the church in that way. He's always leading us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Isn't it amazing when you walk into a room and it's like, whoa, what is that smell in here? It's just amazing how, how our, our noses pick up on just the slight amounts of smoke or the slight amount of this or that in the air, and we can distinguish and our brains automatically think about things. I know there are things that uh, if, I if I smell certain combinations of oil and grease and fuel, it takes me back to working on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. I think, oh man, whoa, flashback. <laughs> Don't want to go back there, you know. And I think about things and I, I remember things. And you, you remember foods, you know, as you smell things. You think about your childhood and what your mom used to make and all those kind of things. It's amazing the 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 gift of smell that God has given us. And so he's using this, this whole scene of a Roman triumph, that incense that's burning as they're parading the, the conquering army through the streets. 
to the people in that town, oh, yeah, victory, finally. Our husbands have come home. Our sons have come home. And our children have come home. And, and they're, they're alive. They've conquered. They've won the victory. All those kind of ideas. And that aroma, that fragrance that is being brought forth as a result of those incense burning is a, a beautiful smell to them. But again, to the guys that are being towed behind, it's a horrible smell because it's the smell of death and we are headed for uh, death. And so it's, don't be confused about thinking, well, as Christians, we conquer the unsaved and who cares about them and we're glad they're going to get killed by the lions. It's not that. Christ has conquered death. Amen. He has conquered death itself. Death and the grave he has conquered. And that's the picture that is being viewed here. As Christ came and he died on that cross and he rose from the dead, he conquered death and hell. And we are the fragrance of that victory as we walk through this life. And we can either be a sweet smell to those who are, are getting saved or have, are, already are saved, or we can be that foul smell and hopefully it brings somebody to faith in Christ themselves as, uh, as we walk through town, as we walk into the places that we work. God diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. And so, again, you have to see that knowledge there, too. Uh, we're living in a very dark world. We're living in a, a world that has a lot of deception, a lot of lies that are being told to people, and people are just... They're walking into walls. They're blind. They're, they're, you know, blind people being led by blind people. And they're all falling into the ditch. And you and I have uh, night vision goggles on, right? We can see through the darkness with these spiritual goggles that the Lord has given us. And we're able to not fall into that ditch. And we're able to come alongside people and help them up Get them on the right path so that they don't fall in the ditch anymore. We are diffusing knowledge of salvation to people who are falling in the ditch and are going to hell for eternity. And so that's kind of a, an image I think you need to keep with you. Uh, if you never use those night vision goggles, if you never turn those things on and you just don't care, uh, I don't care about the other people as long as I'm saved, as long as I'm going to heaven, praise the Lord. Whew, going to slip right under that gate. Everything's great, you know. Come on. Jesus, his heart breaks over people going to hell. Mm -hmm. The Father's heart breaks for people who reject him and who are lost and lying in the ditch and deceived. And he wants us to go over and help those people out of that ditch and diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge in every place that we go. Amen? Amen? That's what he's called us to do, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, 1 Corinthians, again, the first letter that Paul wrote, chapter 5, verse 11. Uh, that's actually not what we're going to read at all. Uh, this is just a quote from somebody. That's a typo. Forget that. That thing at the bottom of the orange, forget that. Uh, this sudden outburst of gratitude, in contrast to the previous dejection in Troas, begins a long digression all the way to chapter 7, this commentator says, on the glory of the Christian ministry. And so again, from this point on, you know, Paul was bummed in Troas, but Christ always leads us to victory if we're willing to follow him. He's always leading us to victory. And, and for the next uh, four or five chapters or so, that's the kind of stuff we're going to be dealing with. We can be grateful because it gives the world the finest exposition of the Christian ministry in existence. One that reveals the wealth of Paul's nature and his mature grasp of the great things in service for Christ. And truly it is that. And remember I told you when I first started teaching the book here that when I first read this as a, a believer, a new believer, a young believer, I just thought, well, I don't even know what that means. What is that? Why, why, is that, why is that even in the Bible? You know, 2 Corinthians. I couldn't even figure out why the book of 2 Corinthians was in the Bible. It just didn't seem like inspired text to me. Because it's such this uh, rubber meets the road kind of Christianity, 
it just doesn't seem to come to the level, or it didn't seem to come to the level of, of Scripture to me for some reason. But now, as a more mature believer, you see the majesty of what Paul is saying and how, how profound it is. You see the level of his maturity and the level of his understanding about what this Christian walk is, what this Christian life is. And it is a masterpiece. It is an absolute masterpiece. And you'll see that as we go along uh, through the book. So in verse 15, he says, We are to God the fragrance of Christ. We are the fragrance of Christ. We are giving off the odor of Christ. But look what he says, Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. People are getting, if we're walking correctly, if we're conducting our lives in the right way, if we're giving a good testimony about what a Christian should be out in that world, then those fumes are coming off of us. Those fumes are just diffusing everywhere we go. We're like Linus, you know, with that blanket. And stuff's just trailing on behind us. You know, people pick up on it. They pick up on this person is different. There's, there's something that smells weird about this person, you know. This person stinks, you know. The other people, I don't like this person at all, you know. If you, for some reason, they just hate you for some reason. Have you ever experienced that? And, uh, and it is this, you know, as you walk in the spirit, as you live your life in the right way, you are just automatically diffusing the love of Christ. And people are either going to love that and want more of that, or they're going to hate you for it. Because they are, again, on their way to uh, destruction. They are perishing. Unless you repent, Jesus said, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent. And so people who are unwilling to repent are on that road. They're headed for the Colosseum. They're headed for the wild beasts for eternity. And uh, what a conviction it should bring in our hearts that we have the ability to at least try to save them, at least try to bring the fragrance of the knowledge of God to them so that they can try to understand it and repent of their sins. We don't know, uh, and so we have to try. Um, in verse 16, he goes on with that idea. He says, to the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. That fragrance that's coming forth from us, uh, if they're not willing to repent, all they're seeing is death. All they're getting from us is this smell of death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. Again, some uh, that are in that place of being willing to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, willing to accept the need to come to salvation. When they hear us, when they see us, when our lives influence their lives in some way, there should be a conviction that comes to their heart in which the Holy Spirit is working in and through us to bring conviction and to bring this idea of this person has the answer that I need and maybe they'll come and talk to you. If you don't go to them first, maybe they'll come and talk to you because they're sensing in your life there's something different there. There's, you know, you're not whining and moaning like everybody else is. Even though you're in a worse situation maybe than they're in, all they see coming from you is praise and, and honor and good things and good fruit coming from your life. Kindness and self-control coming from your life. They're witnessing the aroma coming from you. And it's something that they say, I need that. I need that. If you listen to Geraldine's testimony, uh, she... Raised in a Lutheran church, very strict kind of uh, traditional uh, Lutheran faith. But she started attending a church where it had a big youth group and all the youth would come together and they'd just be worshiping the Lord. And Gerilyn's standing there going, well, I was raised in the church, but I don't know what this is all about. And, and she just got so convicted that I want what they have. I don't have the Jesus that they have. I've got some weird traditional thing that I learned from my mommy and daddy, but there's nothing going on in here. And I see it in their lives. And I want what they've got. I want what they've got. The aroma was coming forth. And, and Gerilyn saw it and she wanted it as well. And so what kind of 
smell is coming forth from your life, maybe. But let's not ask that question. Let's just move on. <laughs> Who is sufficient for these things? Right? It's heavy, isn't it? It's this whole idea of, wow, life and death, the matters of life and death, and my life is, is you know, either going to send somebody into that place of death or it's going to send somebody to a place of life. And who's sufficient for that is what Paul is saying. When Paul recognizes the influence that we can have in the lives of other people, he, he just comes to this place and says, man, who's, who's even sufficient? Who, who can handle that kind of stuff? And so we're going to get into that more uh, when we get into chapter 3. Because in verse 5, Paul goes into that idea a little bit more. He says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being uh, from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Yeah, you're not sufficient for it. I am not sufficient for it. None of us are sufficient for us. Our sufficiency is from the Lord. And so again, when we trust the Lord, when we just say, Lord, I put my life in your hands, you lead me, you guide me. I'm going to take some little steps of faith here and, and I'm just going to trust you to point me in the right direction. And as I'm going in that direction, I just pray that the fragrance of Christ will be coming forth from my life and people will have a sense of that and want to talk to me about it or they'll allow me to talk to them about it. Uh, and, and hopefully I can pick some people out of the ditch along the way. Hopefully I can bring and, and show people the fragrance of the knowledge of God in their own lives enough to where they can come to repentance. And so we are not sufficient of ourselves. But at the same time, if you go into verse 17, Paul says, we are not as so many peddling the word of God. We're not sufficient for those things, but also we're not just peddling stuff out there. We're not just throwing stuff out there to make people happy or to try to get them to give me money or, or any of that kind of stuff. We sincerely want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a distinction between the, the real church and a church that's just peddling the word of God in order to fill the seats and build a big building. You know, there's a distinction between those two types of churches. And if we are sincere about our faith, and if we're not just peddling the word of God out there, trying to use it as a, as a selling point for something, or try to manipulate people into doing something for us, or to make us rich, or any other false motivation that is in the church, or we just want to have lots of people come and listen to us, and that kind of stuff. No, we're not peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity... As from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. That's what we're doing. And if we're ever doing anything different from that here, you need to go find another church to go to. If we ever veer away from those ideals right there, hey, sincerely, we just want to come and, and diffuse the fragrance of the knowledge of God to you so that you can come to faith in Jesus Christ and bring others also. We want to teach you and equip you so you can go out there into that dark world out there, find some open doors and pull people out of the ditch and then drag them back here or drag them to some other church that's preaching the word and not peddling the word. Amen? That's what we're here to do. Is we're here to love each other. We're here to care for each other. We're here to worship the Lord ourselves. But we're here to take the word of God and allow it to wash us first and cleanse us and then be able to take it out and tell others about Jesus Christ. Diffuse that fragrance out into that lost and dying world out there where people are going to hell for eternity. And so uh, that's all I have for this morning, but I, I just want to leave you with this idea of the smell of victory. Yes, the ministry can be brutal sometimes. It can be hard. Church cannot be fun to go to. But ultimately... If we are doing the things that God has called us to do, he is always leading us to victory. He's always leading us to open doors of ministry opportunities, not only for this church, but for you in your own personal life. And so be pushing on those doors out there. Try to find out what does the Lord want me to do? I'm taking little steps of faith here, pushing on doors. Oh, that one opened right up. Let's see what the Lord has inside that door. 
be used by the Lord to touch this world. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to study it together. But Father, we also examine our own hearts and recognize, Lord, that there are, are places in our hearts that probably don't diffuse the right smell out there in the world. And so, Father, correct us. Change our hearts, Lord. Deal with us in the areas that we need to be dealt with so that we can be those who are able to walk through this life and diffuse your love, diffuse your forgiveness. And when we walk by, people will just have a sense of, of love and, and faith and hope your mercy, your forgiveness. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.